All right, I'm back and I'm going to read uh, right where we left off yesterday um, in The Alchemist, um, just so that way we are all on the same page again. Uh, the main character in yesterday's reading had finally found the alchemist um, and he had met with him in person after the failed attempt of that one tribe that was in the war uh, to attack the oasis that he was living in. Um, so it's picking back up and Santiago, the main character, is with uh, the alchemist. It says... The following night, the boy appeared at the alchemist's tent with a horse. The alchemist was ready, and he mounted his own steed and placed the falcon on his left shoulder. He said to the boy, show me where there is life out in the desert. Only those who can see such signs of life are able to find treasure. The boy began to ride out over the sands with the moon light lighting their way. I don't know if I'll be able to find life in the desert, the boy thought. I don't know the desert that well yet. He wanted to say to the alchemist, but he was afraid of the man. They reached the rocky place where the boy had seen the hawks in the sky, but now there was only silence and the wind. I don't know how to find life in the desert, the boy said. I don't know if there is life here. Uh, oh, excuse me. I know that there is life here, but I don't know where to look. Uh, life attracts life, the alchemist answered. And then the boy understood. He loosened the reins on his horse who galloped forward over the rocks and sand. The alchemist followed the boy's horse, followed as the boy's horse ran for almost half an hour. They could no longer see the palms of the oasis, only the gigantic moon above them and its silver reflections from the stones of the desert. Suddenly, for no apparent reason, the boy's horse began to slow. There is life here, the boy said to the alchemist. I don't, uh, I don't know the language of the desert, but my horse knows the language of life. They dismounted, and the alchemist said nothing. Advancing slowly, they searched among the stones. The alchemist stopped abruptly and bent to the ground. There was a hole there among the stones. The alchemist put his hand into the hole, and then his entire arm, up to his shoulder. Something was moving there, and in the alchemist's eyes, the boy could only see his eyes, squinted with his effort. His arm seemed to be battling with whatever it was in the hole. Within an emotion that startled the boy, he withdrew his arm and leaped to his feet. In his hand, he grasped a snake by the tail. The boy leapt as well, but away, uh, but away from the alchemist. The snake fought frantically, making hissing sounds that shattered the silence of the desert. It was a cobra whose venom could kill a person within minutes. Watch out for his venom, the boy said, even though the alchemist had put his hand in the hole and had surely already been bitten. His expression was calm. The alchemist is 200 years old, the Englishman had told him. He must know how to deal with snakes in the desert. The boy watched as his companion went to his horse and withdrew a scimitar. With its blade, he drew a circle in the sand and then placed the snake within it. The serpent immediately relaxed. Not to worry, said the alchemist. He won't leave the circle. You found life in the desert, the omen that I needed. Why was that so important? Because the pyramids are surrounded by the desert. The boy didn't want to talk about the pyramids. His heart was heavy, and he had been melancholy since the previous night. To continue his search for the treasure meant that he had to abandon Fatima. I'm going to guide you across the desert, the alchemist said. I want to stay in the oasis, the boy answered. I found Fatima, and as far as I'm concerned, she's worth more than treasure. Fatima is a woman of the desert, said the alchemist. She knows that men have to go away in order to return. And she, uh, she already has a treasure. It's you. Now she expects that you will find what it is that you are looking for. Well, what if I decide to stay? Let me tell you what will happen. You'll be the counselor of the oasis. You have enough gold to buy many sheep and many camels. You'll marry Fatima and you'll both be happy for a year. You'll learn to love the desert, and you'll get to know each one of the 50,000 palms. You'll watch them as they grow, demonstrating how the world is always changing. And you'll get better and better at understanding the omens, because the desert is the best teacher there is. But sometime during the second year, you'll remember about the treasure. The omens will begin incessantly to speak of it, and you'll try to ignore them. 
you'll use your knowledge for the wealth uh, for the welfare of the oasis and its inhabitants. The tribal chieftains will appreciate what you do, and your camels will bring you wealth and power. During the third year, the omens will continue to speak of your treasure and your personal legend. You'll walk around night after night at the oasis, and Fatima will be unhappy because she'll feel it is he, uh, it is she who interrupted your quest. But uh, you will love her, and she will return your love. You'll remember that she never asked you to stay, because a woman of the desert knows that she must await the men of the desert. So you won't blame her, but many times you'll walk the sands of the desert thinking that maybe you could have left, that you could have trusted more in your love for Fatima, because what kept you at the oasis was your own fear, was your own fear that you might never come back. At that point, the omens will tell you that your treasure is buried forever. Then, sometime during the fourth year, the omens will abandon you because you've stopped listening to them. The tribal chieftains will see that, and you'll be dismissed from your position as counselor. But by then, you'll be a rich merchant with many camels and a great deal of merchandise. You'll spend the rest of your days knowing that you didn't pursue your personal legend, and now it's too late. You must understand that, you're, that love never keeps a man from pursuing his personal legend. If he abandons that pursuit, it's because it wasn't true love. The love that speaks is the language of the world. The alchemist erased the circle in the sand, and the snake slithered away among the rocks. The boy remembered the crystal merchant who had always wanted to go to Mecca, and the Englishman in search of the alchemist. He thought of the woman who he who had trusted. Uh, excuse me. He thought of the woman who had trusted in the desert, and he looked out over the desert uh, that had brought him to the woman he loved. They mounted their horses, and this time it was the boy who followed the alchemist back to the oasis. The wind brought the sounds of the oasis to them, and the boy tried to hear Fatima's voice. But that night, as he had watched the cobra within the circle, the strange horseman with the falcon on his shoulder had spoken a love and treasure of the woman of the desert and his personal legend. I'm going with you, the boy said, and he immediately felt peace in his heart. We'll leave tomorrow before sunrise. Was the, was the only response from the alchemist. The boy spent a sleepless night. Two hours before dawn, he woke one of the boys who slept in his tent and asked him to show where Fatima lived. They went to her tent and the boy gave his friend enough gold to buy a sheep. Then he asked his friend to go to the tent where Fatima was sleeping and to awaken her and tell her that he was waiting outside. The young boy did as, was, as he was asked and he was given enough gold to buy yet another sheep. Now leave us alone, uh, said the boy to the young Arab boy. The young boy returned to his tent to sleep, proud to have helped the counselor of the oasis and happy at having enough money to buy himself some sheep. Fatima appeared at the entrance to the tent. The two walked out among the palms. The boy knew that it was a violation of the tradition, but it didn't matter to him now. I'm going away, he said, and I want you to know that I'm coming back I love you because... Don't say anything, Fatima interrupted him. One is loved because one is loved. No reason is needed for that love. But the boy continued, I had a dream and I met with the king. I sold crystal and crossed the desert. And because the tribes declared war, I went into the well seeking the alchemist. So I love you because the entire universe conspired to help me find you. The two embraced and it was the first time they either had touched each other. I'll be back, the boy said. Before this, I always looked to the desert with longing, said Fatima. Now it will be with hope. My father went away one day, but he returned with my, but he returned to my mother, and he has always come back since then. They said nothing else. They walked a bit farther among the palms, and then the boy left her at the entrance to her tent. I'll return just as your father came back to your mother, he said. He saw that Fatima's eyes were filled with tears. Why are you crying? I'm a woman of the desert, she said, averting her face. But above all, I am a person. Fatima went back to her tent, and when daylight came, she went out to do the chores that she had uh, done for years. But everything had changed. The boy was no longer at the oasis, and the oasis would never again have the same meaning it had only yesterday. I would no long, it would no longer be a place with 50,000 palm trees and 300 wells where the pilgrims arrived relieved at the end of their long journeys. 
From that day on, the oasis would be an empty place for her. From that day on, it was the desert that would be important. She would look to it every day and would try to guess which star the boy was following in search of his treasure. She would have to send her kisses in the wind, hoping that the wind would touch the boy's face and tell him that she was alive, that she was waiting for him, a woman erating a courageous man in search of his own treasure. From that day on, the desert would represent only one thing to her, the hope for his return. Don't think about what you left behind, the alchemist said to the boy as they began to ride across the sands of the desert. Everything is written in the soul of the world, and there is... Uh, and there it will stay forever. Men dream more about coming home than about leaving, the boy said. He was already reaccustomed to the desert silence. If what one finds is made of pure matter, it will never spoil, and one can always come back. If what you found was only a moment of light, like the explosion of a star, you will find nothing on your return. Man was speaking the language of alchemy, but the boy knew what he was, that he was referring to Fatima. It was difficult not to think about what he had left behind. The desert, with its endless monotony, put him into dreaming. The boy could still see the palm trees, the wells, and the face of the woman that he loved. He could, never, uh, he could see the Englishman at his, at, at his experiments and the camel driver who was a teacher without realizing it. Maybe the alchemist has never been in love, the boy thought. The alchemist rode in front with the falcon on his shoulder. The bird knew the language of the desert well, and whenever they stopped, he flew off in search of game. On the first day, he returned with a rabbit, and on the second, with two birds. At night, they spread their sleeping gear and uh, kept their fires hidden. The desert nights were cold and were becoming darker and darker as the phases of the moon passed. They went on for a week, speaking only of the precautions they needed to follow in order to avoid the battles between the tribes. The war continued, and at times the wind carried the sweet, sickly smell of blood. Battles had been fought nearby, and the wind reminded the boy that there was the language of omens, always ready to show him what his eyes had failed to observe. On the seventh day, the alchemist decided to make camp earlier than usual. The falcon flew off to find game, and the alchemist offered his water container to the boy. You are almost at the end of the journey, said the alchemist, and I congratulate you for having pursued your personal legend. And you've told me nothing along the way, said the boy. I thought you were going to teach me some of the things you know. A while ago, I rode through the desert with a man who had many books on alchemy, but I wasn't able to learn anything from them. There is only one way to learn, the alchemist answered, and it's through action. Everything you need to know, you have learned through your journey. You need to learn only one thing more. The boy wanted to know what that was, but the alchemist was searching the horizon, looking for the falcon. Why are you called the alchemist? Because that's what I am. And what went wrong with other al when other alchemists tried to make gold and they were unable to do so? They were looking only for gold, his companion answered. They were seeking the treasure of their personal legend without wanting to actually live out that personal legend. Then what is it that I still need to know? The boy asked. But the alchemist continued to look at the horizon and finally the falcon returned with their meal. They dug a hole and lit their fire in it so that the light of the flames would not be seen. I'm an alchemist simply because I'm an alchemist, he said as he prepared the meal. I learned the science from my grandfather who learned from his father, and so on, back to the creation of the world. In those times, the masterwork could be written simply by on an emerald. But men began to reject simple things and to write tracts, interpretations, and physiological, oh, excuse me, and ph philosophical studies. They also began to feel that they knew a better way than others had. Yet the emerald tablet is still alive today. What was written on the emerald tablet, the boy wanted to know. The alchemist began to draw on the sand and completed his drawing in less than five minutes. As he drew, the boy thought of the old king in the plaza where he had met that day. It seemed as if it had taken place years and years ago. This is what was written on the emerald tablet, said the alchemist when he was finished. The boy tried to read what was written in the sand. It's a code, said the boy, a little bit disappointed. It looks like what I saw in the Englishman's books. No, the alchemist answered. 
It's like the flight of those two hawks. They can't be understood by reason alone. The Emerald Tablet is a direct passage to the soul of the world. The, the, when the, excuse me, the wise men understood that this natural world is only an image and a copy of paradise. The existence of this world is simply a guarantee that there exists a world that is perfect. The world was created so that though its visible objects, uh, that through its visual objects, men can understand its spiritual teachings and the marvels of the wisdom. And that's what I meant by action. Should I understand the Emerald Tablet, the boy asked? Perhaps if you were in a laboratory of alchemy, this would be right. This would be the right time to study the best way to understand the Emerald Tablet. But you are in the desert, so immerse yourself in it. The desert will give you an understanding of the world. In fact, anything on the face of the earth will do that. You don't have to understand the desert. All you have to do is contemplate the simple grain of sand, and you will see. Uh, and, and then, excuse me, uh, will, sorry, and you will see it in all the marvels of creation. How do I immerse myself in the desert? You have to listen to your heart. It knows all things because it came from the soul of the world, and it one day will return there. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and end today's reading on, on that note, um, and I'll pick it up tomorrow. So, until next time, thanks.